keep your Bibles open to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to be looking at these verses in, in some detail this morning. And I must admit, I, I found it a, a, a great joy this week studying 2 Timothy as I've done my reading in preparation for preaching these 10 verses. I, I've delighted in reading uh, great men of God who've gone before, who've written for us, who, men who love the Lord, who love the gospel, and men who are not ashamed of it. I've also this week, in a few different places and, and in a few different ways, seen and read about people who are ashamed of the gospel. People who have turned away from the gospel. People who have distorted or dominated the gospel for their own agenda. And so I've seen afresh the need to preach the gospel clearly, diligently and carefully. And I came, I've come to appreciate it even more fully why Paul has taken such care in writing these things to Timothy. And for us this morning, we need to be so clear on the gospel because brothers and sisters, we are to be gospel people. That's who we are. The church is the container into which Christ has deposited the gospel. It is only in the church that it can be found. It is only from the church that it can be taught. And so we must take seriously our calling to guard the good deposit entrusted to us. Without clarity on the gospel, we're lost. We're lost and we're useless and we will be spat out. Without a steadfastness in Christ and in the gospel, we are, we're no longer of any use, are we? As the church. We are no longer the church. We, we are a salt that has lost its saltiness. And we know what happens to that. It is the gospel that defines us. It is the gospel that shapes us. It is the gospel that saves us. And so we better be crystal clear on what the gospel is. Clear on what it is. And we've got to be clear on it so we can preserve it and pass it on to our children. And we need to know what it is so as we've been thinking this morning we can proclaim it to a world that is in darkness. And this was a concern that Paul had for Timothy when he writes in verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Paul's concern here is to impress upon Timothy the glory of the gospel. The glory of the gospel. And, and to bring to, Timothy, to Timothy's mind the, the responsibility that he has to be faithful to it in his ministry. If we lose the glory of the gospel... If we, we lose the weightiness of the gospel, then we are rudderless. We are adrift without direction. And other things are going to creep in. If we lose that glory, if we lose that weightiness, other things are going to creep in and take our attention. And we're going to be confused and we're going to be distracted. Whether it be the prosperity gospel whether it be charismatic excess, whether it be moralistic teaching, whatever it might be that we let in to distract us from the gospel, that will happen when we lose the glory of the true gospel. If we lose the glory, then we substitute other things in or we add things and we lose the gospel, we lose who we are and we lose what we're for. As we were thinking about last week, and if we lose the gospel, then we've lost everything. Everything is lost. And so Paul calls Timothy and us to not be ashamed. Don't turn from it. Don't turn from this gospel that I've given you. Don't try and make it more palatable. Don't change it to make it more comfortable. 
do not be ashamed. Let me say here, it's not that Paul uh, thought that Timothy was ashamed. It's not that Paul was worried that he was heading that way. It's not a rebuke here that we have, but rather an encouragement. The grammar of the Greek, and I'll spare you why, but it tells us this. It tells us it's not an imperative, it's not a command, it's an encouragement. And so here as Paul writes, he's not a drill sergeant who's, who's shouting at a soldier who sat down in the middle of an exercise. But rather he's a, a fellow marathon runner calling to, to another one, keep going, don't give up. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Let's do this. Let's keep going, Timothy. And this is the call that he issues to the church, to us this morning, to you. Don't give up. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't lose the glory. And so he says again in verse 8, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. There we see that to not be ashamed is contrasted with suffering for. Don't be ashamed, but suffer for. And we see that the testimony of our Lord is interchangeably used with the gospel. The testimony of the Lord is the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the testimony, but suffer for the testimony, the gospel. And Paul answers our question then, what, what is that gospel? What is the gospel that we're not to be ashamed of? The gospel that we're called to suffer for? What is it that we've been given? Well, let's look at verses 9 and 10. Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is the gospel, Paul says, and the first thing he says about the gospel is it saves us. Paul moves immediately from a reference to the gospel to its central truth that God saved us. That's the first thing he says about the gospel. That is what the gospel is to us as gospel people. It is salvation. It's salvation. It's impossible to speak of the gospel without speaking of salvation. Paul says it again in Romans 1.16, something very similar. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of salvation. Paul writes about the gospel in these same terms throughout the New Testament, always speaking of the gospel as being through Jesus, by God's purpose, by grace and not by works. He's clear on those throughout the New Testament, always and unchanging, that is the gospel. And so here in 2 Timothy, this, as we were thinking last week and as Pastor Rich explained so well, this is the last letter that Paul wrote, certainly that we have. Here in this last letter he wrote, we see that he's preaching the very same gospel as he preached in the first letter he wrote, which we looked at just a few months ago, the letter to the Galatians. The gospel has not changed through the passing years between Galatians and 2 Timothy. It has not been amended. It has not been added to. It has not been retracted from. Paul hasn't had something else in that time. Let's change this. No. The gospel is unchanged. There is only one gospel of salvation. And here in this little um, treatise of the gospel that Paul writes here, he sums it up for us. He sums up its character, its source, and its grounds of the gospel. We're going to look at each of these in verses eight, uh, 9 and 10. The character of the gospel and the character of salvation it's summed up in three phrases here in verses 9 and 10. 
The character of salvation can be said as this. He saved us. He called us to a holy calling. And he brought life and immortality to light. That is the characteristics of salvation. It's clear then, isn't it, to us as we read this, that salvation is is much more than, can I say, just forgiveness. It encompasses that, doesn't it? Forgiveness is, is central to the gospel, but it's also more. I think sometimes we speak uh, of the gospel as just forgiveness and nothing more past that. But it is more, isn't it? It's sanctification. It's been made holy. It's been made more like Jesus, becoming more like him, killing sin in your life. It's not an optional extra to be holy, to be being made more holy. It's not an optional extra to to try to work to put to death the, the, the works of sin in your life. It is a characteristic of the gospel. Paul writes then, when he saved us, when Jesus saved us, he he called us to a, a holy calling. Through the gospel we are called to be holy, to be set apart for him, distinct, different from the world, having different priorities, gospel priorities. Paul writes elsewhere, for God has not called us for impurity, but for holiness. Holiness is then an integral part of salvation. We cannot escape it. It is a characteristic. But what else do we see here as a, as, as a character of the gospel? Well, what do we get when we think of this holiness that we're called to and this immortality that Christ has bought for us? When we put those two things together, what do we have? We have glorification. The ultimate eternal perfection of believers Yet future being made more like Jesus. One day ultimately we'll be be perfectly like him and immortal. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. That's the process we're on. That's the trajectory we're on towards glorification. Forgiveness. Holiness and immortality are three aspects of God's great salvation, the gospel. And as I, as I suggested earlier, we need to rescue the term gospel. We need to rescue it from the weak and warped ways that it's so often and so easily used. The gospel is, is not just the account of the cross. That is the gospel, but it's not just that. It's not just forgiveness. Forgiveness is part of the gospel, but it's not just that. The gospel contains the whole of the teaching of Scripture. All of it. Salvation is a majestic word that proclaims the comprehensive work of God by which he justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies his people. That's the gospel. That's what we mean, that's what Paul means when he talks about the gospel here. This, Paul says, is the character of the gospel we proclaim, that we hold to. Namely, that he saved us to be holy eternally. He saved us to be holy eternally. Paul in this treatise of the gospel, secondly, addresses not only the character of salvation, but the source of salvation. The source of salvation. Look at verse 9. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. If we were to uh, trace the... the, um, If we were to follow the river of salvation back to its source, where would we find it? Would each of us find it on that day when we we turned to Christ and confessed him? Is that the beginning? No, that's not what this passage says, is it? If we trace it back to its beginning point, where would we be? In eternity past. In times eternal. Before, Paul's words here literally mean before eternal times. We can hardly comprehend it. But this is when the gospel began. 
That's when it was conceived before the creation of the world. The gospel was. We can't fully grasp these truths, can we? I don't think we can, but, but we must grapple with them. We must understand them in as much as the scriptures tell us about them. We must wrestle to love them and to know them. God has given us something. Before the world began, he'd given us something already. Grace. He'd already shown us grace before even the world, from all eternity. If we wind back the clock as far as we can before us, before you, before your parents, before your grandparents, before the fall, before creation, wind the clock back to then and there was already grace for you. Isn't that amazing? It's a phenomenal thought. It's a a brain-breaking thought. But let me say this also. The doctrine of election and predestination in Christ is never introduced in Scripture to baffle us. Uh, Nor is it just there to stir curiosity and have debates. It's there for a purpose. It's there to bring God glory. It's there for a practical purpose. And here, as elsewhere in Scripture, the purpose is to bring us to humility To bring us to gratitude that God has done this for us. And it should bring us peace and assurance that salvation, the gospel, does not rest on me, praise the Lord. It does not rest on my goodness. It does not rest on my works. It does not rest on what I can do for myself. But it rests on what has already been given to me in Christ. From before the world began. From times eternal. That's the character of the gospel. That's the source of the gospel. And now Paul comes to the grounds of the gospel. The grounds of salvation. Our salvation, the gospel, rests firmly on the historical work performed by Christ. So although God gave us his grace from before the ages began, now here in verse 10 we read, it is now manifest, he's manifested it. He's revealed it, shown it in the revealing, in the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus. So it's been given to us then, and in Christ it is shown. Salvation is rooted, it is grounded in an event in history. In a time that we can look to, that we can see, that we can know, that has been recorded for us. We can't so well comprehend before times eternal, but we can understand that Christ came in history to work and act at the cross. The giving of God's grace was secret and eternal, but the manifesting of it, the showing of it, the revealing of it was historical and public. It is known to us. We see it. We have confidence in it. There is something in history, namely the life, death and resurrection of Jesus on which we can ground the gospel. That we can look to and say, there, that is the manifestation of the gospel. That happened in Jesus. And what was it that Jesus did when he manifested God's grace in history? We see in verse 10, He abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And there's a sermon right there in those 13 words. So much could be said on just those 13 words. We're not going to have another sermon within a sermon this morning, though. You'll be glad to hear. But putting it together... What we do see here then is the great truths of these two verses in 9 and 10. We're going to see in a minute what Paul tells us to do with the gospel. But first he's very clear about telling us what it is. And so in verses 9 and 10 we see five stages by which God's saving purposes unfold. I just want you to see these. So the five stages by which the gospel unfolds. The first one is the eternal gift of grace in Jesus from eternity past. 
The second is the historical appearing of Jesus to abolish death and bring life by his death and resurrection. The third is the personal call of God to sinners through the preaching of the gospel. The fourth is the sanctification of those believers, those who respond to the gospel, those who come to life, are brought to life and brought to Christ and made more like him. And the fifth is the future, resurrected, immortal perfection and glorification of each believer. We see these five stages here in these two verses. All of this is the gospel, Paul says. Paul traces the gospel from eternity past through the working of Jesus through to the ultimate destiny of the believer in eternity future. And how, where is he writing all of this? All of this from a prison cell. Such was the glory of the gospel to Paul. Such was his weightiness and the hope that it instilled in him that he'd lift his mind and his soul to such epic gospel heights even though he had humanly been brought so low, rotting in a cell, in a dungeon, he lifts his eyes to the gospel and writes this for Timothy. This is the, this is the gospel that, that should lift our eyes, bought for us in eternity past, secured for us in eternity future. It should lift our vision from our deathly surroundings, and they are. Death is all around this world is dying. It's, it's waiting for resurrection. But we lift our eyes in the gospel and it should cause our souls to soar in eternity. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. That is the gospel hope that Timothy has received, that Paul has received from Jesus and that he now passes on once more to Timothy and to the church. And he writes this letter to encourage Timothy to once again preach the gospel. Don't be ashamed. Speak of its glory. Speak of its weightiness. Speak of its sufficiency. And to stir Timothy and the church into gospel living and gospel action. That's what the gospel is. And, and now Paul goes on to tell Timothy what to do with it. That action that, that we are called to as gospel people is outlined in three duties here. Communicate the gospel. Suffer for the gospel. And guard the gospel. These three duties are ours now too. They were Timothy's and they're also ours. They are duties of the church. They are our calling as gospel people. Firstly then, we must communicate the gospel. If, as, as Paul has instructed in verse 10, the life, life and immortality are brought to light through the gospel, that's the only way. Life and immortality are brought to light through the gospel, and if, as we know from elsewhere in Scripture, our purpose and duty is to bring people to spiritual and eternal life, then surely the way we do that is by proclaiming the gospel. We're not here to, to put on a, a show. We're not here to, to entertain people. We're here to love people. And we're here to show the gospel to people. And more importantly, we're here to preach the gospel to people. That is what we're for. That's the only way that life will be brought about. So Paul continues in verse 11, writing, the, the, he goes on from the talk about the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher. Paul has been called to all three of these roles we can only be called at most to two of them. Some of us will be called to two, some to one, and some of us, many of us, won't be called to either of these roles. What is the distinction then between these three offices of apostle, preacher, and teacher? This will be helpful for us to think about. Well, the apostles, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they, they formulated the gospel, didn't they? They've written um, the, the, the most of the New Testament for us, they formulated the gospel. Preachers proclaim it as heralds. 
and teachers instruct in its doctrines. Now, those last last two often, and perhaps arguably should, come together many times. Let me say, there are no there are no apostles today. There are no apostles today. That's why I say we can only be preachers or teachers. The New Testament uses this term in a, in a very restricted way, in a very clear way. The spiritual gift and office of apostleship died with John. The gospel was formulated by the apostles, by the Holy Spirit, and it was given to the church in the form of the New Testament. It's all here, all of it. All that we need is here. We don't need any further revelation. We read in Ephesians that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. It's all here. The Lord has said all that he needs to in his scriptures. They are complete. They are sufficient. The canon of scripture is closed. There is no other gospel. There can be no new gospel. There can be no addition to the gospel. And therefore, there can be no more apostles. But there are still teachers and preachers, men and women called by God to devote themselves to the work of preaching and teaching the gospel. Men to preaching, women preaching to women, women teaching women. Proclaiming it to us and helping us to apply it to our lives. But, I hear you thinking now, well Doug, maybe I haven't been called to either of those offices. But even if you haven't been called to one of these distinct offices, one of these roles, we each as Christians, as disciples, and we've been thinking a lot about this in our series in Luke, haven't we? We have a duty to communicate the gospel. I say a duty. It should also be a joy. It should be a joy. We could go elsewhere to emphasize this, couldn't we? I mean, 1 Peter 2 verse 9, we look at the beginning of of the past few years as our kind of uh, motto verse. Of course, that gives us a mandate to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus. But even here in verse 8, we have a general broad call to not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord And so we, all of us, must not be ashamed of testifying to our Lord, of testifying to Jesus, the testimony of Jesus being the gospel. If you are Christ's, if you are his, and I uphold completely what Tony said, we're not all given the gift of of evangelists, but if you are his, then you are called. And you are already equipped To communicate the gospel by your words and by your life. It is your duty. If you can't communicate the gospel, if you can't tell somebody the gospel and explain the gospel, then I'm going to say it's because it's not real to you. It's because you don't know it. It's because you've not received it yet yourself. Some have naturally, humanly speaking, better communication skills than others. But if Christ has brought you to life in the gospel, then you are equipped to tell others about Jesus. We are to communicate the gospel. Our second duty then is to suffer for the gospel. And this will often be the result of the first duty of communicating the gospel. Paul says in verse 11, rolling on from 10, I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher... That is why I suffer as I do. The reason I suffer, says Paul, is because I preach the gospel. I'm not in prison for any other reason. Always my suffering has been because I preached the gospel. And what is the link between suffering and the gospel? What is it about being gospel people that means we will suffer? This might not be news to you, but the world hates the gospel. The world is opposed to the gospel. Man's heart is hardened against the proclamation of truth. We read, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. The God of this world, small g. The natural man hates to have to admit the seriousness of his sin and guilt, hates to admit his helplessness, hates to admit their need of God. 
hates to admit any accountability to a higher power beyond themselves, hates the idea, actually, that they can't earn salvation for themselves. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. To proclaim the gospel in this dark world, to preach Christ crucified and nothing else, to stand in a plural society and say, enough, there is but one way to God and it is Jesus. That is offensive to this world. And the world, led by its God, small g, will turn on you, will want to silence you and end you. They do it a little bit more politely in the UK, but across the world we're doing it in not such polite ways. And Paul knew it. And so the question is, are we tempted to to sit in our little Christian corner and keep ourselves to ourselves? Never say anything which might offend, but at the same time, never say anything that's going to bring life or repentance or conversion or glory to God. Will we cower in the corner and say, please don't hurt me? Or or do we take a little step out of the corner and and proclaim a gospel, but not a true one? Sanitize it, market it, soften it, remove all the nasty bits that are hard to swallow. Or will we stand with Paul, who stands with Christ? Paul has already called Timothy to suffer in verse 8, but now he emphasizes it, saying, I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not prepared to do. I have suffered for the gospel, and so must you. Suffer as I do, and do not be ashamed, says Paul. We are to communicate the gospel, suffer for the gospel, and finally, guard the gospel. Verse 13. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So Paul's told us uh, what the gospel is and here he refers to it it, with two expressions. It's both uh, the pattern of sound words and the precious deposit. So the gospel is the pattern of sound words. What does he mean by this? Well, here, really, the word sound means healthy, good, healthy words, wholesome words, life-giving words. Only the gospel gives us life. Only the gospel gives us life, and we would do well to remember that law doesn't give us life. Only grace gives us life. Works doesn't give us life. Only grace gives us life. The gospel is the sound words. And it is the pattern of sound words. That is, not a pattern like a a sketch, an outline sketch that you you fill in the gaps or that you expound upon. It's not a, a, a pattern as in an example to follow. Well, I'll try and follow this pattern. It's stronger than that here. Rather, what Paul is communicating is it's the standards of good words. Follow the life-giving, wholesome, perfect standard of the gospel. It is to become your devotion, your life, your hope. It is to be the rule by which you now live your life. And so it is, and it is also to be characterized by, at the end of verse 13, this is important, the faith and love of Jesus. Paul is not only concerned with what Thomas, Timothy is to do, but how he's to do it. Our theological convictions and our communication of the gospel, while offensive, should be the only thing that causes offense. The way that we teach and instruct people and call people to Christ is with the love of Christ. We're not to be self-righteous. We're not to be arrogant. But in love, call people to life and repentance as we each were ourselves. By the standard of these sound words, the gospel. 
But it's not only a standard of sound words, of healthy words, but it's also the good deposit. It's a treasure. It's a deposit, a treasure, a good one that's been given to the church. It's a precious treasure that's been deposited into the church, into you and me, for safe keeping. And so we are called to see it as that. Do we see it as a treasure? Do we see it as valuable? A precious deposit that we're called to guard? Paul charges Timothy with guarding the gospel. And what he means by that is making sure it's not lost and making sure it's not broken. Because there were heretics around, weren't there? There were wolves who would seek to corrupt the gospel, to change it, even just a little bit, to make it fit with their own agenda. And that's still a problem today, isn't it? That's still going on even today. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, as we thought about last week, against the background of what happened in and around Ephesus, the, the capital of Asia, which is uh, where, near where Timothy was. And so in verse 15 he says, You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. There seems, therefore, to have been some who have turned away from Paul. In fact, it, it, not some, but all. Some event that has caused the churches in Asia, uh, not the Asia we know, but, but around Ephesus, uh, to turn away from Paul, to be ashamed of him. Perhaps it was his arrest, this final arrest, has caused him to turn from him. We don't, we don't know. Uh, and Phygelus and Hermogenes, again, we don't know exactly who they were, but they were likely the ringleaders of this um, turning away or they were leaders in the churches there. We don't know. But there was one who was an encouragement to Paul, Onesiphorus, who had sought him out, who had refreshed Paul, who had found him, who had stood by him in gospel love and solidarity. And so Paul prays for Onesiphorus and for his family. Do you notice he prays for them separately? I think he's suggesting here that while he has been ministering to Paul, he's been away from his family. He's been with Paul, away from his family. And so this family also has sacrificed having a husband and a father around for a time for the sake of the gospel. We we don't know for certain exactly what the situation is here. But what we do know is that all of Asia, all the churches in Asia had turned away from Paul except for Anesiphorus. And so it was in this situation of complete apostasy, that is the church turning away from the gospel, that, Timothy, that Paul charges Timothy to guard the good deposits. This is going on, Timothy, but you guard it. You keep it. You hold on to those sound words and you live by them. This is the situation we, we find ourselves in today, is it not? The world is in darkness and there are vast swathes of the church that claim to be the church that are preaching another gospel. Around the globe, there are places where it is difficult to preach the gospel. We're feeling the pressure to preach a politically correct gospel, to not say anything which might offend and to play nicely with the world. And so we ask, what can we do? Lord, do you know what it's like out there? And you call us to guard the gospel? How can we? Like Paul, like like Timothy, he was physically weak. We feel that sometimes, don't we? How can we bear this burden to guard the gospel? How can we do it, Lord? Well, there is only one way that we can. And it's not a fleshy way. It's not by political power and might It's not by the strength of armies, nor by the violence of man, but verse 14, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And I'll end with this. Look at the second half of verse 12. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day Uh, what has been entrusted to me do you see paul is saying with he says with confidence that the the deposit this gospel deposit that has been entrusted to him it was christ him who he's believed in 
who would keep it safe until the day when he would have to give account of his stewardship. What's the grounds of Paul's confidence here? I know him. I know him. Paul's confidence was always found in the person of Jesus. We, we know this well, don't we? Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's entrusted the gospel to me. I am to keep it. I am to guard it. I am to preach it, Paul says. But it is in the power of the Spirit and under the hand of Jesus. And so you must do the same, Paul says. You must do the same. And it's a great encouragement, isn't it, to, to those of us, the church, who are called to communicate, suffer for, and guard the gospel. It's, it's an encouragement for us to know that God himself is the guarantor of the gospel. Yes, we may have to see the gospel spoken against, ridiculed, in the workplace, in Parliament, on the TV, in the home for some of us. We may even have to watch an increasing apostasy in the church as we see churches that turn away from the true gospel turn away from the faith of their fathers and follow some other gospel. But do not be afraid, Paul says. God will never allow the light of the gospel to go out. He has privileged us by entrusting the good deposit to us. He has placed his treasure in jars of clay. And so we must, mustn't we? We must play our part in guarding and defending the truth. But in entrusting it to us, in putting it in our hands, he has not taken his hands off. God himself is the final guardian. And he will preserve the truth which he has committed to the church. He will preserve it. And so, guard it faithfully. Spread it actively. Suffer for it bravely. This is our threefold duty in the gospel. Let's pray.